Yeah, good. So I I said to Andrea at just before we started now, I did have a look at what you're doing. And my first reaction was I could learn a lot from you. I don't know whether you have much to learn from me, but I'll try and give you the national picture and then what we're doing within that national picture. I talked about three recent challenges to health inequalities, the decade of austerity, the COVID pandemic and the cost of living crisis. I could probably add two more. Uh, each change of government is a new challenge to health inequalities and it keeps happening, or change of leadership. And it happens so frequently that that by itself is a challenge. Sorry, I can't quite hear you. You're, um, you're breaking up. Can you not hear me? Connection here, so I don't know. Are you still there? I'm still here. Yeah, we lost you for a moment. Um, is it on the phone? No. Well, I don't know what to do. Just see. We haven't got a good connection. I can scarcely he hear you. Not very well. So it's it's hard in and out. Not just, well. You think we've got connection here? It might just be worth seeing if you can turn up your camera. And that, and that. I, I really can't. I mean, I can hear you speaking, but I can't hear the words properly. Um, just, bear with, uh, just bear with us two minutes and we'll just see if we can. We're just talking our Wi Fi at this end. So. I, th I mean, if you're having trouble hearing me, this is not a great Give connection. Two minutes. <coughs> I'm sorry, this isn't working well. Okay. We're just saying, can you hear us now? Is he good? No. It's uh, you're coming through. It's breaking up. It's it's garbled, and it sounds like you're not hearing me well either. No, we got. Let's turn off our camera and just see if that makes a difference. Well, just can you hear me clearly? Uh, yes, and hear you, but we can hear you. Let's turn the camera. Just pull it down. Yeah, so we'll just turn that off. Oh, <laughs> you, what do you, thank you. Can you hear us okay? Well, uh, slightly better, but not. It's not great. Um, if I can, Andrea, we'll go out and go back. Yes, I'm really sure. Just sometimes. It, shall I come out of this and? Shall I leave and try and rejoin? Hello. I just left and rejoined. Hello.
Hello? Just tell me to share this. Hello. Hi. Are you? Yes. Can you can you hear us okay? Well, yeah, that's better than it was, but you haven't yes. said. Yes. Well, you're you're coming through fine now. Oh, you'll hear me from this. And um, you're coming through fine now. Let me just put that camera right back on just a minute while I speak to you. I oh, know you won't see that. Um. So do, I'm just wondering whether I think the problem started when when you. When I was sharing my screen. Should we give it another go? Yeah, can you see my slides? We can see your slides and you're coming through OK at this point. All right. OK, that well, we've turned. Yeah. Shall it I might keep be worth you turning off. Yes, do you want to turn your camera off as well? Just just to double make sure it's we've got all, all the Internet we've got. Thank can you. you still, Brilliant. Can yes. you still see? Can you can still, still see, see my slides? Slide? We can still see them. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's start again. OK, well. Um, so I said there have been three recent challenges to health inequalities, the decade of austerity, the COVID pandemic and the cost of living crisis. And I would say that the instability at the top of government is a further challenge. In February 2020, just before the pandemic, we published Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review, 10 years on. So I was looking back to the original Marmot Review in 2010 to ask what had happened in the last decade. And the answer is, well, it wasn't very good. We really lost a decade. This is life expectancy for women and for men from 1980. In fact, going back to 1900, it had been improving about one year every four years. And in 2010, there was a break in the curve and the rate of improvement slowed dramatically and just about ground to a halt. The question is, what happened in 2010? We had a new government elected, Conservative-led coalition government that had as its number one priority, austerity, rolling back of the state. They said at the time, surely you're not suggesting it's anything we did that led to this slowdown in health improvement. Maybe we've just reached peak life expectancy. So we looked at other countries. This is annual life expectancy improvement in weeks, 2011 to 2017. Estonia, Norway, Slovakia, Hungary, Denmark, Belgium, Austria, Japan, Czech Republic, UK. We had the slowest improvement of any rich country except Iceland and the United States. No, we had not reached peak life expectancy. And if we look at regions, males, females, this is the least deprived 10% for men and for women. And you can see that a big difference between the least deprived and the most deprived 10%. But for the least deprived 10%, the regional differences are quite small. And there was some improvement in life expectancy. If you're rich, it doesn't much matter where you live. If you're poor, the most deprived 10%, the regional differences are much bigger. And particularly for women, life expectancy declined in virtually every region except London. There's London. So this is where we were in 2020, pre-pandemic. Life expectancy had more or less stopped improving. Health inequalities have got bigger and life expectancy for the poorest people had got worse. And arguably this was related 
to a decade of austerity. And if all the rumors that the government is letting out about its autumn statement of further dramatic cuts in public expenditure, this is the likely consequence. Health inequalities will improve, will increase and life expectancy for the poorest people will go down. Implement austerity, bad for the nation's health. Pretty clear. In 2010, I had six domains of recommendations to reduce health inequalities, give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, fair employment and good work for all, a healthy standard of living for all, healthy and sustainable places and communities, and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. So what happened after 2010? In 2009-10, public, public sector expenditure was 42% of GDP. And as I said, the government's number one mission was austerity, rolling back the state. And by golly, they did it. That 42% went down year on year. So by 2018-19, it was 36%. In my 2010 review, I'd coined the rather awkward phrase, proportionate universalism. The idea was that what we need are universalist policies with effort proportionate to need. I was trying to combine two ideas, typical Anglo-Saxon approach of you target the worst off and a more Nordic approach of universalist policies. Ooh, we could call it leveling up. So here's the social gradient. Less, less destitution, deprivation, higher affluence, higher life expectancy. If we focus only on the worst off, we miss the health disadvantage of people above them who have worse health than those at the top. So what we want is universalist policies with effort proportionate to need. What did we get post 2010? Look at the gray bars. This is total local authority spending per person post 2010. In the least deprived 20% of areas, the total spending per person went down by 16%. And then the greater the deprivation, the greater the reduction in spending. In the most deprived 20%, it went down by 32%. What we've got here is effort inversely proportionate to need. The greater the deprivation, the greater the need, the greater the need, the greater the reduction in spending. Could this have played a role in the slowdown in health improvement? The increase in inequalities, the decline in life expectancy in the poorest areas? Yeah, I think it could. I won't go through all of my recommendations, but give every child the best start in life. Child poverty defined as less than 60% median income. Before housing costs in 2010, 18% of children were in poverty, after housing costs, 27%, and that 27% went up to 30% over the decade. How was that achieved? Changes in net household incomes due to tax and benefit reforms by income. So the red is working age families with children. This is household income decile. If you were in the poorest 10% of household income, your income would have gone down by 20% as a result of changes to the tax and benefit system. In the second poorest decile, it would have gone down by 12%. And then the richer you were, the less the reduction. Some reduction at the top, 
but nowhere near as big as the reduction at the bottom. Government policy was to make poor people poorer and increase inequality, and they succeeded. And we don't look very good. Here's 41 OECD countries. Child poverty, again defined as less than 60% median income, is calculated slightly differently uh, from the figures I just showed you. The average is 20%. Countries like Iceland, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Finland, Korea, child poverty at 10 or 11%. Out of 41 countries, the United States ranks 38th, and we rank 31st. 31st out of 41 countries. We're saying we're quite comfortable having children grow up in poverty. In Finland, child poverty before redistribution during tax, by tax and benefits is higher than in the US. But in Finland, they don't like kids to grow up in poverty. Really crazy. So they use the tax and benefits system, tax dollars, euros, whatever, to reduce child poverty. The US and the UK are quite comfortable having children in poverty. So we don't use the benefits and tax system to reduce it. And look at public spending on early child education and care. <clears throat> For the rich countries, the OECD average is about $6,000 per child per year. In Norway, they spend $12,000. The average is six. We spend four. We're not the worst. The US is worse than us. But there we are limping along below average. Not very good, not the worst, but by golly worse than average. And we're going to being told we're going to have more austerity. Really? We want this country to be even worse compared to Estonia, Slovenia, Lithuania, Australia, Italy, Austria, New Zealand. My goodness. Spending on education. This is real terms change in per pupil funding for the least deprived and the most deprived. This is annual change went down in the most deprived 2015-16, went down across the board, but bigger reductions in more deprived areas, 17, 18, 19, 20, even when it improved during the pandemic, it improved less in the more deprived areas. So we've got a policy of saying, if you're a child in a more deprived area, you'll get less funding for your education. We want to increase inequalities. And it works. Look at GCSE attainment by decile of household income at age 14. Five good GCSEs, including English and maths, in the most deprived 10% of household income. It's less, fewer than 25% get five good GCSEs at C or above, only 25% get as many as five Cs. At the top level, the top decile, it's 70% get five Cs or above. Any A or A star grade, about a third at the least deprived 10%, about 5% get an A or A star grade in the bottom DESA. That's not only funding for education, but it's not helped by regressive settlements in funding for education. So that was all before the pandemic. I waited 10 years to do my 10 year on review. I waited only 10 months to do the COVID-19 Marmot review. And we said from the beginning that COVID would expose the underlying inequalities in society and amplify them. There's the social gradient in all cause mortality by level of deprivation. 
of the area of residence, and there's the social gradient in COVID-19. It looks almost exactly parallel, slightly steeper gradient than for all cause mortality, which means, yes, we do need to control the virus, vaccination, social distancing, mask wearing and the like. But we need to deal with the underlying inequalities. I said it would expose and amplify the inequalities. This is life expectancy 2018 to 20 compared with the previous three years. What I showed you at the beginning was life expectancy declining for the poorest 10%. Here, we've got life expectancy declining for the poorest 40%. In fact, for men, it didn't improve at all for these three years compared with the previous three years. For women, it did increase, it did improve in the least deprived 60%. So we did not do well during the pandemic. This is from American colleagues. Life expectancy in the US compared with what they call 19 peer countries. So in the US, life expectancy in 2020 fell compared with 2019, fell again in 2021. So the 21 figure is way below the 2019 figure. And the other countries look bad as Scotland, Northern Ireland, Germany and England and Wales. We did very poorly during the pandemic not as bad as the US. And that goes back to how we were pre-pandemic. I think of health as a measure of societal success. And pre-pandemic, life expectancy was stalling, the inequalities were increasing, and life expectancy for the poorest people was falling. And that slowdown in life expectancy was nearly the slowest of all rich countries, except the US. And during the pandemic, we had the highest excess mortality in the first wave and over two years, steepest fall in life expectancy, except the US. What's the link between our poor health pre-pandemic and our poor health during the pandemic? I think it works at four levels, poor governance and political culture, increasing social and economic inequalities, the reduction in spending on public services, we were ill prepared and we're not very healthy. The government the tw elected in 2019 had as a priority leveling up and it produced a leveling up white paper. I wrote a commentary on it for the BMJ and I applauded the four missions, the 12 objectives. I said, if you meet these four missions and the 12 objectives, health inequalities will get less, no question. Good level of analysis. The problem is in the white paper, they pointed out that leveling up in Germany when the former German Deutsche Democratic Republic was incorporated into the Federal Republic, Germany spent 2 trillion euros over 25 years. That's about 70 billion pounds a year on levelling up. Did it work? Well, this was life expectancy for women in the West and women in the East. Reunification. Hey, that's not bad. They closed the gap. Men, reunification, the gap narrowed, it didn't quite close, but it looked like it kind of worked. So they spent 70 billion pounds a year. In the white paper, they said the leveling up budget for four years was 4.8 billion pounds, 1.2 billion pounds a year, as against 70 billion pounds. This is not serious. And will there be any money for leveling up given the autumn statement that's coming? It seems highly unlikely. 
IPPR North calculated that the 2021 allocation of the levelling up fund amounted to £32 per person in the North. The drop in annual council service spending over the last decade was £413 per person per year in the North and 388 across England. So we took £413 per person per year away. We're going to give you £32 back and you can level up with that. This is insulting. It's derisory. And the third major challenge is the cost of living crisis, which I've described as a humanitarian calamity. And of course, when inflation is 10% or here, uh, the calculation from the Institute for Fiscal Studies, 11% in the least deprived 20%. It's just under 18% in the most deprived 20%. Why? For obvious reasons. A higher proportion of household expenditure, if you're poor, is on energy and food. And those were particularly hit by inflation. So when we talk about headline inflation figures of 10 or 11 percent, we're talking about 18 percent in the most deprived, and it's a gradient. We produced a report on the 1st of September, two months ago, saying without government intervention, 60 percent of households would be facing fuel poverty this winter. Even with government intervention, there'll be huge proportions facing fuel poverty. And fuel poverty has three components. Poverty, household income, the cost of energy, and energy efficiency of the dwelling. Well, poverty has been rising for a decade. The cost of energy relates to our hugely dysfunctional energy market. It's a total mess. A total mess when the price, 60% of our energy comes from nuclear and renewables. But when the price of gas goes up, we pay more for nuclear and renewables. This is a crazy, crazy market. And so far, we've been pussyfooting around the idea of taxing them properly. And the government stopped investing in home insulation in 2013, fell off a cliff. And the UK has the biggest gap between richest and poorest in energy costs as a proportion of income. So in the UK, the poorest 10% spend 17.8%, just under 18% of their income on energy. The richest spend 6%. In France, the richest spend 6%, but the poorest spend 10%, not 18%. So this inequality is bigger in the UK than in any other rich country. And then, of course, if you're lucky enough, there's air quotes around lucky, to get on the housing ladder, pre-mini budget, this is the, um, the cash increase in mortgage costs from the third quartile of 2022 and post mini budget, that's the increase in mortgage costs. So on average, mortgage households will be £3,500 worse off by the end of 2024. So these are annual mortgage costs. Twentieth vintiles, twentieths of household income, except for the instability in the poorest 20%. The base case, if benefits are uprated in line with inflation, then this is the drop in income. And you can see that the poorer will continue, poor people will continue to get poorer, and it follows a gradient. And the additional hit if benefits are only uprated by earnings, 
is considerable. So even in the best case, the poorest 5% will be poorer, 13% poorer. Wow. And that's because of inflation and other things. Food insecurity. The latest figures from the Food Foundation. One in six of families without children in September 2022 had food insecurity. One in four of families with children. Food insecurity means going without food for a whole day, not eating when you're hungry or not eating enough to satisfy your hunger. So fuel poverty, food insecurity will damage physical health and mental health. And just to remind you, we heard a lot of nonsense about we've got the highest tax levels for 70 years. We are a very low tax country. The actual proportion depends where you look. These figures come from the IMF. Tax government revenue as a percentage share of gross domestic product. Finland, 52 percent. France, just under 52 percent. Belgium, Sweden, Austria, Italy, Germany, Norway, blah, blah, blah. and the UK, just under 36 percent. We are a low tax country, not as low as the US at 31 percent. It was a piece in the Financial Times. If we raised the tax level by 1% of GDP, which would take us up to the OECD average, that would fill most of the fiscal black hole without cutting public expenditure. All very depressing. Now, the good news, working with localities, after my 2010 report, Coventry declared itself a Marmot City. We've been working with Greater Manchester. Luton declared itself a Marmot Town. Waltham Forest, Cheshire, Merseyside, Lancashire and Cumbria. Leeds has approached us. North of Tyne, I've just been approached by South Yorkshire. Gwent wants to be the first Marmot region in Wales. So, Coventry of Marmot City took my six domains of recommendations and built their planning for the city around them. We did a report, Build Back Fairer in Greater Manchester, and this was our model of Building Back Fairer. I won't go into the details, but the city of Manchester uh, last Monday published their strategy of building a fairer Manchester for the next five years based on this report. Really exciting. Altogether fairer in Cheshire and Merseyside. And for the first time, we've got business involved. Legal in general approached me and said, we have 1.3 trillion pounds it's hard to get my head around 1.3 trillion pounds under investment. We want to know if what we do could improve health and reduce health inequalities. So my colleagues and I produced this report, The Business of Health Equity, the Marmot Review for Industry. And we had three domains of recommendations, good quality work, pay, benefits, conditions, hours, products and services. Do they make your clients and customers healthier or less healthy? And the impact on communities, the environment, employment, purchasing, and so on. So three domains where business can make a positive contribution to improving health and reducing inequalities. The East London Foundation Trust said they have the ambition to be the first Marmot Trust. The M Marmot Mountain, I thought that was a ski resort, but never mind. Um, ELFT, the East London Foundation Trust, as a training and employment provider, our service users, and the wider Luton community. 
not bad, and universal and targeted. So it's not only for business to take this approach, but public sector organizations as well. So I come back. The six principles I started with give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, fair employment and good work for all, ensure everyone has at least the minimum income necessary for a healthy life, healthy and sustainable places and communities, and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. And we've now added to tackle discrimination, racism and their outcomes and pursue environmental sustainability and health equity together. But we do have to address what I said before, poor governance and political culture, reverse the increasing social and economic inequalities, reverse not just say austerity is over, but reverse the reduction in spending on public services and deal with the fact that we weren't very healthy. Often I get asked, What's the one thing you would rec recommend? One thing? Put health and well being at the heart of all government policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Marmot. I don't know if you can hear the applause um, in the room, but there's um, there's applause in the room for that. And we do thank you for your um, insights into um, the data, which absolutely makes it clear that health inequalities are unfair. And definitely when we look at that international comparison, 